this is extreme chaos. Uh, there's a pandemic going on. Uh, cities are literally burning. Um, there's rebellions and upheavals. Like this is stuff that we have never seen before. And I just, I, I think it's like really, really egotistical to assume people are just gonna invest in Bitcoin. <laughs> At this point, uh, it's clear that we are going to have a recession that's more severe than the global financial crisis. We are looking at other available options. More and more people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another really interesting guest, Rachel Siegel, aka Crypto Finally, someone who will not only give us a perspective from a millennial standpoint, but tell us how things are going in this space in terms of mass adoption, understanding millennials, why Bitcoin, and many other fascinating topics. And before we start, a big shout out to Emil from the Capital. Thank you so much for sourcing great themes, topics, and questions. Great content for those who want to spend time reading more. So without further ado, Rachel, it's a pleasure to have you. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to come speak with you. I know we've been planning this for a little bit, and I'm just excited to be here and start the conversation. Yeah, and thank you so much for being such a great ambassador and helping us, you know, share the message to the communities. I know you've been doing a really, really good job. But first and foremost, I'd love to ask you, Rachel, you know, we had Tom Lee on the show and one of the previous shows, and he was talking about how this Bitcoin and crypto movement will mainly be triggered by the new generations, so millennials. So he really believed and concluded through his studies and research that every time there's a big shift in generations, that's where true adoption and that's how the actual paradigm shifts to another paradigm. But what drove you into this space? Is it true? Is it something that just resonates well with the millennials in general? Um, I mean, I believe that to be true. Uh, so the reason I got involved in this space was I was able to go out to some of the networking events prior to my true involvement with cryptocurrency. I had friends in the space um, and I really just saw the community and the opportunity behind it. And that sort of excited me about cryptocurrency and blockchain um, and really that we were on the ground floor of something big. You know, I thought that to be a good opportunity. Um, but overall, I really do believe that it does excite millennials as a specific group um, because that's a group that got really stuck uh, in the gig economy. You know, um, they a lot of people in the millennial group were working part time jobs, were working gig jobs, were freelancers. Um, and cryptocurrency really did provide a niche uh, that was not otherwise provided to them prior. Mm, that's really well put. And speaking of which, you talked about having part time jobs and different jobs to support your living. A lot of people have been making this meme joke about the, brrr, you know, printing all that, the money. Um, and a lot of people take it a lot more seriously. Like Andreas Antonopoulos says things that we're stealing the future of the younger generations. We're taking money away from our grandchildren. We're putting society into debt. Um, but then a lot of other people see it differently. They're like, yeah, but the stimulus is actually helping people who don't have jobs as of today. So what is your overall view on this? Are you, yeah, just what is your overall view? 
I mean, you know, I understand the argument that it helps people today. You know, um, I, I get that, but all, nothing that's going to happen right now is going to help people in the long run. Um, I think that there, I think that it's a band aid on a much larger issue, obviously, which is a large problem that people are having with it. Um, it's clearly a band aid. It's not a long term solution, and it does result in negative, negative things in the future. Um, but but no, I, I I think that there are two sides to it. You know, I can understand people resolving that in the here and now it might be helpful to individual families, individual uh, people who have individual stories. Um, and I can understand that. But in the long term, um, no, we haven't found a solution. Um, and yes, it is detrimental uh, to our monetary system overall. Is that what really makes you interested in Bitcoin itself? Obviously, the monetary system. One thing that's really funny, Rachel, is... You know, so in my days, in the 90s, when you'd go to school, you know, like the main topic or the hot topic for everyone to study was critical thinking, just because we're, we're not good at critical thinking, right? It was just something that you had to learn throughout academic studies and stuff like that. But when I talk to, for example, my cousins, the, all the millennials, the Gen Y, Gen Z, they are just critical by nature. You know, it's really hard to get, convince them on anything, on build trusting, on building trust with them. So what made you trust Bitcoin and what interests you in particular related to that? What made me trust Bitcoin? You know, it's real, it's tangible. Um, you can understand it and all the information is there. Um, and then what made me use it, you know, uh, was the future that I see for it. You know, the fact that I really do believe this is a new emerging technology. You know, I think it's on par uh, with things like television and the Internet and streaming. Um, I think that it really can be a next big moment um, in the way that common consumers interact with technology. Um, and I think that being on this level of it is just is, is such a fascinating time. You know, there's going to be huge growth in the future um, and not necessarily when I say that, do I mean price growth, though? I do believe that that will be true as well. But I think there's going to be uh, more common use of uh, cryptocurrency technology, of blockchain technology uh, in ways that really help people, um, even if they're not necessarily thinking that they need that right now. I, I do believe that it's going to serve in many ways, and, and I think that it's going to be really big. That's massive. And I know you have a lot of messaging around inclusion and something that you're really interested in and not just, you know, the price movement. But I do have just one question related to price. Recently, obviously, Goldman Sachs was really brutal with us, you know, saying that, you know, Bitcoin had zero value. And uh, and basically every single point that was mentioned, maybe in, you know, 2010, 11, 12, they just brought back these old, you know, recycled BS messages. But at the same time, Adam Back, you know, as of today, just mentioned that Bitcoin could go all the way up to 300K, which is interesting because Adam Back is more of a technologist, not really the guy who talks about pricing. Uh, 300K, $300,000 seems like a lot, but of course it would depend on the devaluing of other currencies. But what is your kind of idea on that? How do you feel about people putting these, these high price tags on Bitcoin? I mean, I, I understand it. I understand the concept of the market cap and the idea of someone really large getting involved. You know, all it's going to really take um, to see major price movement is like a billionaire to, you know, put all of their assets into Bitcoin. We're going to see big price movement. Um, that's really where we're at. Um, it, it There's a very small percentage of uh, people who are invested and uh the more that we grow, I can see it growing larger. You know, it's all speculative. <laughs> so again, you know, it's going to go up or it's going to go down. And I'm not a technical analyst. I'm not someone who does price prediction. So I was just preface with all that. Um, I'm not someone who necessarily does those things. But I do understand the reasoning as to why people believe that it would grow in the future. Um, I also think that the Goldman Sachs incident was like, a little strange in its own nature. I, th I think that email was very emotional. Um, I think that there was a lot of uh, stuff that was written in it um, that, you know, while maybe being true, isn't untrue of other uh, traditional assets. You know, they said something like it went down like a certain percentage. It's like, OK, but like a lot of things have gone down a certain percentage. Um, what makes Bitcoin not an asset class because of this? I, I think that it was I think it was evidently rooted in more than just trying to smash Bitcoin. And hopefully savvy investors, people who are actually interested in finding places to, um, you know, invest, 
are going to be able to look past sort of that volatility in the email. But that's my opinion of the email itself. It's funny because actually after that announcement, Bitcoin surged like $500. So a lot of people would think if a, you know, a trusted institution like Goldman Sachs said something bad, you know, a price would plunge, but people reacted positively and didn't really care, right? Yeah, well, I just think it's the way they said it, honestly. Like, I think that that email, I, I don't think it was very well written to accomplish what they were trying to accomplish. Um, they tried to tick off some nerves, but in doing so, they also managed to say some things that, that you know, aren't necessarily specific to Bitcoin as an asset class, but using them as reasons to uh, denounce Bitcoin. And that, that was sort of strange. Yeah, definitely really, really strange. And Rachel, so there's one question that I always wanted to ask Millennial. It just came up to me right now. But, you know, like in my generation, if you work for a bank, you were like cool, right? But nowadays people tend to say that crypto is a cool thing. Is it uncool to be a part of a bank nowadays for for your for you and for your friends and stuff like that? And is it cool to be a crypto or what's <laughs> I mean, I've never had a friend who worked for a bank, like first off. So uh, I don't really know. You know what I did? I actually think I had an old roommate who worked like some weird back end like HR for a bank of sorts. But anyway, I she wasn't cool anyway. Um but but um no, I don't think that like we put coolness on banks and not banking. Um, you know, I think that the idea of crypto is cool. I think that people are fascinated by it in a cooler way than like if I walk up to you and tell you like, hey, like I keep my money at Bank in America, you know, like no one's going to want to like sit at a bar and talk to me about that. But um, so it might be cool in that aspect that that it's new when it comes to millennials. Like I think people are interested by it. Um, people often are interested by it when I say that I'm involved in cryptocurrency. Um I've never thought to mention that I use a traditional banking system when talking to someone, you know, <laughs> it's never come to mind. Um, all of this also makes me wonder how old you are because you keep saying you're like really old. <laughs> <laughs> I turned I turn 40 this year, Rachel. So yeah, I'm an old man. I feel like a geezer. <laughs> there you go, guys. You know that I'm 40. You're anyway. not ancient. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing I would love to ask you is, you know, a lot of the sentiment that we're trying to guess related to millennials is through these surveys, right? It's like, oh, you know, one out of 10 millennials holds Bitcoin. Or, you know, some people may say that, you know, it's the Google search uh, trends that will show you that millennials are getting more and more interested. Um, is that true? Like, how do you, it's really hard to measure. And I don't know, I know you, you might not have the perfect answer to this, but how do you measure like millennial interest in Bitcoin and crypto? Um, you know, I think it's hard. I, I think that's a hard question. It's, it would be how do you measure interest in anything, um, you know, in any group. Um, so, I mean, obviously taking demographic polls of understanding and interest is important if like that's your question. Um, but I, what you're talking about with Google, Google Trends, I mean, I think that's interesting to show, um, you know, I, I mean, you can break down the demographic of the Google Trends and tell me like what the age margin is of people who are searching for Bitcoin. Um, I guess that's feasible. Uh, but if you want to show a true interest, you know, you have to start with those people who are having the conversations. You know, I, I don't know how many times I had a conversation about Bitcoin cryptocurrency before I really like went on the internet and started learning about it. You know, it's first you hear about it. Second, you say to your friends, have you heard about it? Third, your friends tell you they've never heard about it. It's a scam. Like fourth, you wait and make new friends. It, it goes like that, um, especially for people who aren't already exposed, who aren't already interested in this sort of thing. Um, so I, I think it's a it's a more of a broad stroke if you're trying to understand um, what amount of millennials are interested in in cryptocurrency as a whole. Um, but the Google trends are interesting, um, and I do think they provide us with interesting data as far as um, the way that the trend lines sort of follow the market, you know, uh, the search term Bitcoin uh, pretty, pretty directly correlates or finds a way to correlate to the Bitcoin market itself. Um, and I find that to be really fascinating. And so I don't know, you know, what necessarily that says about people's interest. Um, you know, are they learning about it and searching it for the first time and then investing Um or is there a larger picture to it? But but I do think that sentiment uh, really does matter. So I, I think these are important questions. Okay, interesting. And so you're obviously an influencer. You're very um, well versed when it comes to online metrics and Twitter. And obviously you have friends offline. But overall, would you say that you know millennials are getting more and more interested as you know as we've had this you know unfortunate crisis and stuff like that? Do you have people asking you more? about Bitcoin or help or asking you just to educate them on, on this matter? 
a little bit. I don't. I haven't had a lot of people like respond to like these crises with the thought of Bitcoin. To be honest, you know, I think that I think that you know, not to say like that question or or, or this conversation is like a little pretentious, but I think the concept that we like thought that the world's going to basically end and all of a sudden people are going to invest in Bitcoin, like. It's here nor there, um, and I think there's a lot more to tackle. I, I don't think that Bitcoin necessarily saves the world in an instance like this, especially when there's this lack of knowledge, exposure, and a, a ability to use Bitcoin. You know, I know that it's it's pretty easy to do. I know that pretty much anyone with like a smartphone can access Bitcoin, but it, it's a hurdle of understanding. You know, it's not just hey, um, we know that you know. Coinbase, Gemini, whatever these like like custodial wallets that are going to be pretty simple for an average user to figure out. Um, not that I'm recommending a custodial wallet, just using it as an example for a newbie. Um, it's pretty easy for them to figure out, but like what's going to make them want to do it? What's going to make them think that that's a smart thing to do? What what's going to like inform them that that's the wallet to use? Um, you know, how do they get started in, in a smart way? So I, I think that it's. It's more about the understanding. Um, I think that it always like really does circle back to the understanding when it comes to what's going to happen next. And I think that there needs to be more understanding before people can start making assumptions like, well, obviously when when chaos breaks out, Bitcoin's going to be the prime investment. It's going to be the prime hedge. Um, I don't think there's enough knowledge out there for that to happen at this day and age. I think that if the world imploded today, that Bitcoin would have seen. Uh, most, you know, obviously we're going to still talk about those billionaires who can get in and out and like make a big change. But as far as like a common consumer adoption, um, it would, I think, stagger Bitcoin um, if we saw a complete decline. I, I think it would stagger knowledge of Bitcoin availability of getting involved. Um, also mentioning the distractions, you know, this is extreme chaos. Uh, there's a pandemic going on. Uh, cities are literally burning. Um, there's rebellions and upheavals. Like this is stuff that we have never seen before. And I just, I, I think it's like really, really egotistical to assume people are just gonna invest in Bitcoin. <laughs> so really long answer, but that's what I have to say. No, but it's, it's a good answer. You know, I really like the fact that you're talking about using, using, using rather than buying or investing and I think that's uh, a lot of people see that as as the real way to mass adoption. I know Roger Ver, all he does, and, and I've known him for years now. All he does is to get people to transact through a, from mm -hmm. from wallet to the other, so for people to see that it's really easy to use. Um, you do a lot of education yourself, and you have a bit of a fun factor to it, right? You you use music and different tools. Can you tell us a little bit about your approach to trying to educate the community? It's because it's a bit fun compared to the traditional approach. Yeah, I mean, I'm all about um, accessibility and inclusion. Uh, so that means getting people involved in cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, blockchain, uh, who might not otherwise be here. And and in part, that means addressing the language that we use, the way that we talk about these subjects and the way that we portray them to an outside audience. So I do, I made those fun music videos about Bitcoin, which are easy for people to understand and sort of get you into the concept of it. I do pretty simple, short videos that break down um, concepts in the Bitcoin community, um, how to use certain things, uh, you know, making it more easy for yourself. But primarily, I really do focus on breaking down that language and I hope that I can help people who are within the community right now, um, companies who work in the blockchain sector to understand that there is importance in breaking down that language um, and accessing people who think differently because at the end of the day we're, we can do a back and forth and retort with each other over and over again about um, we have to make it easier to use but it is easy to use but I don't understand it well that makes you dumb for not understanding it. Um, people's brains work differently in the same way that we all have different skill sets we have different paths of understanding blockchain technology and cryptocurrency and and addressing that is so important um because we cannot be just this group of people with this extreme mathematical intelligence running around telling everyone else that they should get it because it, they're just not going to get it. It's just not the case. Our minds work differently. And I find different uh, interesting ways to address that. But but that's really the message that I'm trying to bring out with everything that I do in this space. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, the whole edutainment word has been really big these days with uh, uh, the new generation and stuff like that. And, and, and there are a lot of these videos that go viral, right? When they're fun, when it's one guy like 
bat rap battling the other and they're talking about crypto versus you know uh central banking and, and money printing they're really fun to watch right it just makes you want to stick there to the end yeah no i i agree are you talking about uh, timothy de la ghetto yeah <laughs> i was looking for the name i followed timothy on <laughs> instagram and twitter for a really long time i had a really big crush on him right i just like from his mtv stuff like i thought he was great it lets it let people laugh about the fact that i like him from mtv i don't care yeah, it was a really good video and uh, a lot of fun, you know, and we'll put links to the Crypto Finally channels as well for other people to see how you're trying to educate through a little bit of a, a fun approach. And you just mentioned someone that you love to follow. Were there are, are there any other like people in the crypto space that you love to follow that that educate us really well that you think are a good example for people who want to branch out and learn even more? Um, you know, obviously we spoke about Andreas a little bit. I think Andreas Antonopoulos is obviously like a good big name to throw out there. Um, I like his philosophy. I like that he thinks about the sociological issues that affect the space. Um, and he makes information pretty digestible and understandable. If you haven't heard one of his talks, um, they're, they're pretty, you know, the, what I was talking about when it comes to breaking down that language, uh, he does that pretty successfully. Um, yes. I'm a fan of that, uh, the way that he speaks, the way that he addresses issues and the way that he makes it uh, accessible for other people to understand, even if they might not necessarily be so involved. I saw him speak at Ethereum Denver um, maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, and I remember thinking exactly that, like, wow, this is an interesting talk um, that I think a lot of people could sit down and listen to. And they were, obviously, there were lots and lots of people sitting down and listening. But I, I think that the way he speaks is really important and different um, from what we see a lot of the leaders uh, doing in the space right now. Yeah, definitely a great choice. Yeah, so you heard it, guys. If you want to follow other people, if you're new to the space, Andreas Antonopoulos is a great stop on top of, of course, crypto, finally. Good now, <laughs> um, and I would love to ask you, uh, you just talked about user experience not being as difficult as people say. I would love to hear your thoughts, Rachel, about the future. Where do we go from here? What are some things that you think we need to achieve in order to reach mass adoption uh, this year, next year, or in the years to come? I think that what we really need to focus on, you know, outside of the technology and the UI and the UX is the distribution. So how do we get it out there? How do we get it in front of people? And how do we make it accessible? Um, sort of in the ways that we were just talking about. Uh, how do we make it something that people want to involve themselves in? Um, how do we get them interested in it? And how do we speak their language instead of trying to shove our language down everybody's throat? Um, and I think that if we can attack that, we can probably get a lot done. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely that that's a huge step towards that. And and one last question I'd love to ask you, Rach, um, in terms of your success, you know, for those who want to, you know, find a way to communicate their message, you know, create a community uh, in the crypto space. Like what are some of the tips you've learned or some of the success factors that made crypto finally what it is today? Are there any things that that you felt like, oh, this is a lesson or this is a breakthrough that I've learned throughout this experience? I think it's important to speak out for what you believe in. Um, pay attention to the community. So, you know, while I am someone who tends to double down and push back when I receive <laughs> negative feedback, you know, I have made a lot of change over the last few years. Um, you know, roll with the times um, because the times will roll over you and be as much yourself as you can be, you know, don't, don't scam people. If you're, if you're a scammer, don't be that part of yourself, you know, but be as much yourself as you can be. Um, and try not to allow, um, too much talk to affect that inherent part of you, you know, talk to the community about what it is they want to see, but always make it you. Um, I think that's a really good takeaway from what I've experienced in the community. Um, because they're they're interested in in who you are. Um, they're interested in cryptocurrency, but I think that the person um, who's informing them of this stuff, the person who's trying to help them understand this, uh, really does matter. Um, so be the best you you can. That's the that's great advice. Be the best you you can is definitely something we should all strive for. Um, so if people want to follow you, Rachel, so what are the best sources to get in touch with you? I know that you're active on Twitter. Are there any other ways that people want to support you with the channel or help you create content or whatever? Yeah, um, if you would like to follow me on Twitter, um, I am most active on Twitter. It's my biggest channel at Crypto Finally. I am also on YouTube at Crypto Finally. I do live streams every Friday at 12 p.m. Uh, 
4.15 p.m. Um, with Bitcoin Weatherman and Girl Gone Crypto. And we do live AMAs, talk about the past week in cryptocurrency, uh, learn more about the community and try to sort of help people out. So it's a really good time um, at Crypto Finally everywhere. All right. So there you go, guys. We talked about millennials, the mindset why Bitcoin, the evolution, mass adoption, and many other fascinating topics. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and blast that bell notification so that you can get access to more awesome content and follow Crypto Finally on Twitter and check out the videos on YouTube. Don't forget to join us again, premiering at a PC near you every Wednesday at 8 o'clock BST. We love you guys. Take care.